Greetings aspirants. Welcome to Narayan IAS. This is Ananta Krishna and in this session of daily news analysis, we have picked up certain important articles from Hindu as well as Indian Express. Before dwelling into the articles that we have chosen for today's analysis, I have one request for you all. Please hit the bell icon that you are seeing below and get yourself updated with all the content that we are uploading on this channel Narayana IAS. You are one-stop destination for all of your UPSC civil service examination requirements. We shall now dwell into the articles that we have chosen for today's analysis. The first article that we have chosen is from the Hindu page number 6 titled the MIRV leap that fires up India's nuclear deterrence. Given the fact that India follows what is referred to as the no first use policy, this article seems to be important from the perspective of the possibility of a dual war that might come to India from both the quarters that is from Pakistan and also from China. The second article is from the Indian Express page number 10. It is titled a bank account of her own referring to the much required financial inclusion of particularly the women as a gender. The third article again is from the Indian Express titled oceans have a fever. Here is why which is trying to dwell into the problem of rising sea surface temperatures, ocean surface temperatures pointing to certain disastrous consequences that we may see in the future. The fourth article is from the Hindu which is titled vaccine for dengue may be out in markets by mid 2026 says IIL which is very significant news from the perspective of the public health scenario in India. And the last article that we have chosen is again from the Hindu titled Violence, Homelessness and Women's Mental Health. In this particular article, they are trying to look into the intersectionality of this problem of violence, homelessness and the much, much less understood problem of mental health, particularly of women. Lastly, we also have this practice questions of both preliminary and mains kind. With this, we will try to conclude the today's daily news analysis. We shall now move into the first article that we have chosen for today's analysis. Embark on your UPSC journey with Narayana IAS Academy. Our esteemed five-year and three-year integrated programs are now open for admissions in Hyderabad, Vijayawada and Nellore. Our courses include robust R&D backed initiatives such as daily news analysis, daily news review which are comprehensive review program for a broader understanding of our day-to-day -day happenings which are current affairs. Similarly, we have NCRT program which is a foundational course that covers all the NCRT syllabi which is crucial for UPSC preparation. We also have a mentorship program for personalized guidance and we also have a regular test series for systematic learning and assessment of the student. So begin your journey to become a leader with Narayana IAS Academy today. Embark on this journey, make your dream come into a reality with Narayana IAS Academy. In this particular article, we shall look into the strategic significance of what is referred to as MIRV. As we are seeing here, this MIRV leap that India has had now is trying to fire up what is referred to as India's nuclear deterrence. This article is important from prelims gender science point of view anyhow. On the other hand, as this article is clearly mandating, this is important even from the mains point of view, particularly from the security challenges and their management. We shall look into the details. Look at this previous year question asked in 2014. With reference to Agni 4 missile, which of the following statements is are correct? 1. It's a surface-to-surface -surface missile. 2. It is fueled by liquid propellant only. And 3. It can deliver 1 ton nuclear warheads about 7,500 kilometers away. As you clearly see from this question, this article is clearly in tune with your examination requirements. What is the context? We know that recently, DRDO has conducted what is referred to as the test of Agni-5 ballistic missile. And given the fact that it has this so-called IMRV capabilities, it has been named as 
Divyastra or even the mission has been named as Mission Divyastra. And as this Mission Divyastra has been claimed as accomplished success by DRDO, what we see is that this is being touted as having certain significant strategic implication from the security point of view, particularly from the idea of what is referred to as nuclear deterrence. What is this nuclear deterrence and what is this MIRV technology because of which we are saying that this is part and parcel of increasing and enhancing our minimum credible nuclear deterrence. We clearly know that this MIRVs are referred to as multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. These actually allow a particular ballistic missile to carry multiple warheads such that you can target multiple targets at a particular time. And as you see clearly, these targets can be as wide as 1500 kilometers. However, you can have the precise targeted attacks over these particular targets. Second, this particular striking and this capability can be implemented independent of these targets. Number three, this can also be utilized by major, as we've already clearly seen that this particular capability is already there with five of those permanent members of your United Nations Security Council. Along with this, even Pakistan is also touted to be developing the warheads and developing this particular missile technology on the basis of whatever the deterrence that it wants against the Indian striking capabilities. Moreover, as I clearly said, this nuclear deterrence is one such theoretical framework based on which the nation states would develop their own security and defense capabilities, offensive capabilities. What this nuclear deterrence is? We have to go back into some history. When you know that we, the world was going through what is referred to as the Cold War, the nation started becoming what is called as nuclear states, the ones which own the nuclear weapons. On the other hand, there were few other states which were also aiming to attain this nuclear weapons for their own security requirements. However, it has been perceived that the world is getting nuclearized at a very rapid rate. Because of this, there were efforts to come about a global treaty. And this is what is now is referred to as Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. As part of this Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, there are few states which are referred to as nuclear states and there will be few states which do not have attained this nuclear weapon as a capability for their offensive and defensive requirements. However, and these will be referred to as the non-nuclear weapon states. Given this particular classification, right, we felt that this particular treaty is going to be what is referred to as discriminatory against particularly those states which do not have the nuclear weapons. On the other hand, this basic and core objective of making the world nuclear free will not be possible because those nations which already have the nuclear weapons would be continuing to possessing these nuclear weapons. It is amidst this challenge, there are few nations which have remained out of this NPT. India, for example, Israel, for example, Pakistan. On the other hand, these nations have their own perceived threat from few other nation states. Now, they also started to thinking of developing nuclear weapons for them. In this particular scenario, there emerged this theoretical doctrine called minimum credible deterrence. For example, in any scenario, any nuclear weapon state is attacking another non-nuclear weapon state or nuclear weapon state. Then, how far this particular nation state which is getting attacked is going to be retaliatory against this offensive state is what defined and determined by this theory of minimum credible deterrence. So, in order to deter any such attack, which I might foresee in terms of a threat or I might foresee in terms of a danger, I must have similar capabilities such that it will be deterring my adversary from 
attacking my territory and my people using these nuclear warheads specifically. Hence, these nations started looking for attaining such capabilities. So, as you see that the adversary has certain level or degree of capabilities, you will also be aiming to attain some capability whereby you also enhance your offensive capability against this adversary in the eventuality of any attack. This is what came to be referred to as minimum credible deterrence. This deterrence capability must be credible enough in the eyes of that particular nation state. MIRV technology is being touted as one such particular ability, particularly against both Pakistan and China. And given the range this particular missile has with this capability, it covers the entire territory of China as we know. And hence, this is being now seen as the capability which is part and parcel of your minimum credible deterrence. Moving ahead, this particular nuclear deterrence as I have already seen is referring to this use of nuclear weapons as a deterrent against your potential adversaries. Second, this credible nuclear deterrent as we know relies upon the capability of the one nation state to inflict significant damage on the adversary thus it may dissuade them from going for any hostile actions. Three, in the context of India, we also have this component of no first use policy as part of your nuclear program related policy and however, in case of any kind of attack from our adversary, given this no first use policy, retaliation is going to be much much brutal. Fourth, as we clearly know that this particular nuclear deterrence involves what is referred to as deterrence triad in order to make sure that the second strike capability on our adversary in spite of going through an attack is going to be very very significant even when your one or two nuclear bases are destroyed. So, this deterrence triad has three fundamental components. One, this ICBMs that is intercontinental ballistic missiles which are land based. Second, you have what is called as SLBMs that is submarine launched ballistic missiles which are in fact the sea based as you know that. Third, you also have what is called as air based strategic bombers. Amongst these, we were referring to this land based intercontinental ballistic missiles which is what this Agni-5 is being toted as with this particular MIRV technology. Moreover, as we clearly see here, MIRV is a nuclear deterrent because you can go for what is referred to as multiple and enhanced striking capabilities. Second, it has this ability of evading whatever the missile defense systems that the adversary might have incorporated. Third, this is also counter to particularly the Chinese missile defensive strategies. And fourth, this is in strategic parity with all the regional adversaries. Moving ahead, there is one issue that we have to keep in mind. This successful integration of MIRV with Agni-5 is setting the stage for the further advancement in its nuclear arsenal that it is creating for itself, particularly this submarine launched ballistic missiles, the capability that we are aiming to achieve very, very soon. Second, the continued testing and refinement of MIRV technology is going to enhance India's position as a credible nuclear and missile power and hence this may signal our preparedness to counter any kind of evolving threat that might emerge in future. Next, what, what we see is this continued advancements in terms of technology and also in terms of planning strategically would be crucial in maintaining and strengthening this deterrence capabilities such that given the emerging geopolitical challenges that we are seeing and given the fact that there is an all of a sudden increase in the activity of China particularly within the Indo-Pacific Ocean region and given the geopolitical situations that might emerge in future, this is going to be significant. Lastly, we have to also keep in mind that as we are advancing these technologies, Pakistan is also trying to showcase her 
ability in terms of enhancing this minimum credible nuclear deterrence by which this is going to create another nuclear arms race in this part of the region making South Asia more and more unstable. Even though this is important for our security perspective, it is going to create further problems in future also creating this arms race as a probable and possible challenge for this region to address. Moving to the next article, we will deal with the issue of financial inclusion that has been debated. The NFHS data is not only referring to the aspects of intersectionality as we have discussed in terms of the mental health concerns that we have with respect to women as a gender in Indian society. This is also pointing out to the problems of financial inclusion in India. We shall look into its details. This article is important from GS paper 3 point of view, particularly from the perspective of inclusive growth and the issues which are emerging out of it. Look at this previous year question. Asked in 2022, is inclusive growth possible under market economy? State the significance of financial inclusion in achieving economic growth in India. Even the other question asked in 2016, Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana is necessary for bringing unbanked to the institutional finance fold. Do you agree with this for financial inclusion of the poorer section of the Indian society? Give arguments to justify your opinion. As you clearly see, this particular topic is in tune with your examination requirements, particularly for mains examination. We shall look into its details. What is the context? As you clearly see that the NFHS 5 is pointing to some of the issues related to financial inclusion, particularly for women as a gender in India. Hence, this particular article is trying to showcase the importance and progress of financial inclusion for women in India and what are those factors which are actually influencing it. Before getting into what details this article is talking about in terms of importance and progress of financial inclusion, let us look at what financial inclusion after all is. Financial inclusion includes five fundamental things. One, they must have what is called as a bank account. This initiates the possibility of their so-called inclusion in the activity of economy. Second, they must have within this particular bank account or with regard to this bank account, what is called as access. That means the bank which is providing this account must be within accessible distance. Third, this bank must enable them to get what is called as credit. So credit access becomes the third component of financial inclusion. Fourth, this must also offer a kind of social security which is in the form of any sort of insurance that might be health insurance, that might be life insurance, that might be accidental insurance. It must provide this social security. And fifth, more importantly, all of these four must be told to the one who is trying to be included as part of this financial inclusion efforts that is financial literacy. This financial literacy, even in this age of digital age, is more easy and hence can be more pronounced in order to make sure that financial inclusion is occurring in India. Now we shall look at this importance of financial inclusion of women in India. For the first thing that we have to keep in mind that the financial inclusion is the basis for the entire economic development that might happen within an economy. Given this particular fact, Financial inclusion automatically, hence, must be recognized as even the fundamental basis for the sustainable development and hence they are part of this UN Sustainable Development Goals. Clearly, the access to financial services on the basis of all of those five is crucial to realize the gender equality clearly as we know and also to eradicate poverty. Moreover, Whatever the interconnected goals that we have pertaining to health, education, economic growth and development and any other related dimension now automatically gets linked to the financial inclusion efforts. And you clearly see that this financial inclusion moving ahead as we have already seen that realizing this SDG 5 pertaining to gender equality hence also becomes another pertinent dimension. 
this gender gaps in economic participation is clearly visible. Any economic participation boils down to two fundamental aspects. One, what you are consuming, that is consumption as a process or economic activity. And then, are you participating in production activity? So, this production activity will give you some income and this income is what you will use in order to consume whatever that is required for your sustenance and survival. Putting these two together, for your consumption requirements, you have to participate in the production as an activity to raise certain real income. Both of these together, with the help of this so-called financial inclusion, where you are seeing the role of banks or any other such institutions, institutionalizing this activity of finances, where you are able to open the account. As we have seen, all those five dimensions get now a possibility. Hence, this gender gap report, as it has acknowledged, India has a below average score within this so-called economy criteria. This financial inclusion and hence makes them participate in the fundamentally both of these foundational economic activities. And this will have the multidimensional and multiplier effect as part of developmental efforts. And hence, it, the World Bank says, for every $1 invested in women's financial inclusion, there will be a $3 to $4 return through increased productivity because of their participation. Moving ahead, we also have a global financial inclusion related trend. World Bank's Global Findex Database 2021 shows that the adult ownership of bank accounts or regulated financial institutions have increased globally by 50 percentage points between 2011 and 2020, which is a favorable symptom in terms of further economic and sustainable development. Second, pertaining to Indian scenario, we have witnessed an impressive 42 percentage point jump in terms of this account ownership during the same period. Post Jandhan Yojana, this has magnified with the utility of both Aadhaar stack and also the mobile number. Moreover, this gender gap in account ownership has also been addressed substantially in India. As I said, these initiatives like PMJDY have enabled many women to open the basic savings bank accounts in Indian economy. Moving ahead, if you see here, the National Family Health Survey 5 is able to identify some of the drivers of financial inclusion. One education and skills and here particularly educated women are able to access to microcredit as we have already seen one of the component of financial inclusion. Second, they are able to take loans from these microcredit programs. Third, higher education is leading to the formal credit channels and fourth, digital skills which are as part of their education and skills are also enabling them to use digital payment systems. So, participating in consumption as an activity. Second, occupation and employment status is also being identified as a major driver. Here, working women more likely to know about the microcredit programs. Second, the regular income is also enhancing automatically their access to financial services. Third, this access to electronic media and age automatically enable them to adopt the digital payments Alongside, it also boosts the awareness of the financial inclusion and the use of the digital financial services. Lastly, the household characteristics pertaining to three of the above will also define the efforts of financial inclusion. Here, you see that women-headed households have better access to banking and digital transactions, which is very, very important to note. Second, the gender of the household head is also determining the asset status and also determining wealth status, which is also affecting the access to micro credit. It is all of these pertinent dimensions that NFHS 5 has clearly brought about, showing a positive trend in terms of financial inclusion related efforts in India. Moving to the next article, we'll discuss this article dealing with rising ocean surface temperatures. We'll look into its details. This article is important from the prelims point of view, particularly focusing upon the climate change as a burning problem that the world is staring at. 
Look at this previous year question. In 2019, this has been asked. Assess the impact of global warming on the coral life system with examples. As you clearly see that this rising sea surface temperatures, which in turn can be referred to as increasing heat stress upon the, what is referred to as marine ecosystems, is having its own very adverse consequences. Having adversity over safety, security, and the maintenance of the ecosystems in turn which also impacts millions of lives of even human population who are dependent on these ecosystems for their survival and sustenance. According to this particular organization from European Union that is Copernicus Climate Change Service, we have a situation wherein this average sea surface temperature in February has reached a record high to a levels of more than 21 degree Celsius and this has had its own adverse consequences. However, what are those causes which in fact is pushing this sea surface temperature up? The first such cause is this ocean atmospheric phenomenon that for last three consecutive years which is referred to as triple dip phenomenon in the technical terms in geography has led to this particular situation. This triple dip phenomenon is all about continuation of La Nina for last three years. This La Nina as a phenomenon has been the first chief cause for this so-called ocean warming that we have witnessed as we see for this particular month again. Second, the destruction of coastal ecosystem is the one broader cause that we have to make note of. For example, we know that mangrove forests are the coastal forests that are significant for the maintenance of marine ecosystems, number one. Number two, if you look at the percentage of the mangrove forests within the entire tropical forest, their percentage is mere 1%. However, their significance in terms of entire coastal ecosystems is very, very prominent. With respect to these mangrove forests, what the world has witnessed is, according to this association called Mangrove Alliance, the mangrove forests for last 40 years have seen a decline by nearly 50%. Second, we also have this data from the same organization that from 1990 to 2020, this decline has been nearly by 5%. It is this which has caused this rising sea surface temperatures if you look at the long term phenomenon. Third, the human activity is also one of the prominent reasons, particularly the trade as an activity. 80% of the trade that humans do will be done through maritime shipping and this maritime shipping uses fossil fuels for all its energy requirements and hence this is also one of the chief cause for rising sea surface temperatures. Moreover, we also have this persistent problem of deforestation, persistent problem of fossil fuel burning which are also causes of increasing the temperature in general which are also pushing even the sea surface temperatures up. Moving ahead, these particular rise in temperatures have their own consequences. Number one, what you see is increase in the ocean stratification. We know that the separation of water level within an ocean or sea would be occurring on the basis of density. This rising sea surface temperatures will make the surface waters less dense and hence you see that this separation or stratification of water levels within the sea or the ocean is going to be drastically changing because of this rising sea surface temperatures. Second, we also witness what is referred to as marine heat waves similar to what you witness the land based heat waves. Third, this also has its impact on what is referred to as coral reef as we know most of the times we witness that this rising temperatures will result in what is called as coral bleaching. As you clearly know that this particular coral reefs form part of merely 0.2% of the entire ocean based ecosystems. However, they cater to more than 25% of the ocean species or marine species which is what shows their significance. And this coral bleaching will put 
the adverse impact on all the marine species which are dependent on this particular ecosystem. Moving ahead, we also have this consequence hence on adverse impact on the marine life, consequently having an adverse impact on lives and livelihoods of fishermen across the world. Moreover, this also have its impact on most of the times this migration of marine species towards the northward direction and hence affecting most of the ecosystems and fisheries across the globe. Along with this, it also has the consequences for the global weather patterns as we have clearly seen. Lanina was the pattern that has experienced what is called as triple dip phenomenon and such patterns might also be visible with respect to even El Nino and such patterns might lead to more and more uncertainty with regard to predictability of this weather patterns. Most importantly for us, that is the human or the anthropos that we have to consider with regard to such adverse consequences, what we will see is these activities or livelihoods is going to be adversely affected, number one. And number two, this will also pose risks to the lives of the people infrastructure that you develop and also particularly the human settlements. It is from all these perspectives, this rising sea temperatures has to be considered as one very adverse issue that the human population is facing. Moving to the next article, we we'll look into this new vaccine that is in use pertaining to particularly preventing the dengue fever in India. We shall look into its details. As you see here, this article is important from prelims general science point of view as part of your current events of national and international importance and also for mains from GS paper 3 point of view, developments in science and technology, indigenization of the science and technology under these provisions it is important. Look at this previous year question asked in 2017. Consider the following statements. In tropical regions, Zika virus disease is transmitted by the same mosquito that transmits dengue. Second statement, sexual transmission of Zika virus disease is possible. Which of the statements given above are correct? As you clearly see that this vector bond diseases which are very prone in India become important for your preliminary examination for any particular year. Now dengue vaccine being in the news, this becomes very important for your preliminary examination. We we'll look into the details. As we clearly see that this organization, Indian Immunologicals Limited, which we know that is a wholly owned subsidiary of National Dairy Development Board, has completed their first phase of clinical trials. And this first phase is clearly to determine the safety of the dengue vaccine. This you have to keep in mind. Second, this second and third phases of trials would be beginning shortly and within 2026, we want to bring this particular vaccine into operation. We shall look into the details as to what this particular dengue is. India being a tropical region is known for what is called as vector-borne diseases. India has what is referred to as this vector-borne disease control program. As part of this, we know that we are putting efforts towards controlling six such diseases including malaria, dengue, kala azar, chikungunya and filariasis. And as part of this, dengue is one such particular vector-borne disease that we want to address. As you clearly know that it's a mosquito-borne disease and as we know that this is very prevalent in tropical regions or similar such climates. Second, this is spread by this particular mosquito referred to as Aedes aegypti. Third, this is also the same mosquito which causes even the chikungunya and Zika virus infections. Fourth, we have to keep in mind that either on the basis of antigenically or on the basis of even genetically, we have a dengue virus which is belonging to what is referred to as flavi virus genus which is causing this dengue and there are four related but distinct what is called as serotypes. What is a serotype? As you see here, it's a separate group within a species of microorganisms that all share a similar characteristic. Accordingly, you have what is referred to as DEN1, DEN2, DEN3 and 
den 4. This is some preliminary details about the dengue fever. Moving ahead, we also have certain symptoms which are prevalent when dengue fever has infected a particular individual such as high fever, intense headache or eye pain and also significant pain in the bones, joints and muscles. Accordingly, similar to the vaccine that Indian Immunological Limited is developing, USA's National Institute for Health has already developed a vaccine referred to as CYD TDV vaccine also called as Deng Vaxia and this has received its approval from US FDA that is Food and Drug Administration in 2019 and this is the first vaccine that has been sanctioned in USA. Second, this is weakened form of dengue virus in order to make sure that there is enhanced immunity amongst the individuals. Second, it is recommended for those who are in this age group of 9 and 16 years who have already had a confirmed dengue infection earlier and moreover they are also residing in those areas which are prone to the dengue where it is widespread earlier. Moving ahead, this dengue vaccine particularly for India and also across the globe and if you keep in mind even the African continent, we must keep in mind this data point that nearly half of the world's population is at the risk of contacting this particular disease. Second, even if you look at from the India perspective, it has spread to all the states from a scenario where you had just eight states and union territories which were infected with this vector borne disease. Third, if you look at this particular year alone, we had more than 36 deaths and also more than 35,000 cases showing the significance of this vaccine from the perspective of how fast it can spread. However, there were certain challenges in the development of this particular dengue vaccine in India. Number one, as we know that it is caused by four closely related what is referred to as serotypes of the same virus because of which we know that this dengue fever is caused by the dengue virus. However, the four different but uniquely placed the serotypes are impacting the human or the individual and their immune system uniquely and hence given this distinction development of the vaccine to treat the dengue fever emerging from any of these serotypes is going to be challenging. Second, this infection with one particular serotype gives you lifelong immunity against that particular specific type but not against the others. This is the second challenge that we have. Third, an effective vaccine hence must simultaneously target all the four serotypes in order to offer that comprehensive protection that you are looking for. Moreover, another challenge that you have in this is that the dengue vaccine development is clearly a phenomenon of an antibody dependent enhancement. This we have to keep in mind. That's what I said when I was referring to these serotypes which are antigenetically and genetically distinct but related types. Moreover, this antibody dependent enhancement will occur only when the antibodies produced by a vaccine are helping the dengue virus bind to the human cells facilitating their replication. This can potentially hence lead to severe dengue disease upon subsequent infections when you are infected with different serotypes. This is the biggest challenge that we have in this particular scenario. The development of this vaccine must avoid this AD as a phenomenon while the vaccine is attempting to enhance immunity against all those types of dengue serotypes. Moving to the last article, we'll look into this article dealing with this pertinent issue of one particular huge vulnerable section that India has, the group of women. The women, as you see in this particular article, are subjected to what is referred to as violence, which is also causing what is called as homelessness. And this has its own ramifications in the form of large scale mental health issues. Putting these three together, this article is trying to deal with 
intersectionality of these three issues pertaining to women as a gender in Indian society. This article is important for him, GS2 for the mains examination where issues relating to development and management of social sector or services relating to health is going to be the perspective. Second, we see that women as a vulnerable category and related issues and third, we also have this NFHS5 data whereby the welfare schemes related to the mental health are also subjected to some of the criticism based on whatever the evidences which are emerging from the NFHS5 data. Look at this previous year question asked in 2021 which clearly shows you how important this article is. Though women in post-independent India have excelled in various fields, the social attitude towards women and feminist movement have also been patriarchal. Apart from women education and women empowerment schemes, what interventions can help change this particular milieu? As you clearly see in this article, the way forward is going to be totally distinct from what the government at present is implementing and what is being seen as a solution for a particular symptom. The solution that we are going to offer is going to be broad based upon whatever the understanding that we are getting on the basis of data. Look at this particular context. Recently, this NFHS 5 data has been studied. In this, we observe that 30% of the women between this age group of 18 to 49 years, which is considering the age group which is of the adult population within the women as a gender category, where they say that they have experienced physical violence beginning at this age of 15. This is very, very important. Keep in mind. Second, 6% of this population has experienced what is called as sexual violence. Another aspect that emerges out of this particular data is that 1. Violence and 2. The consequent mental health conditions have a very reciprocal cause and effect relationship and hence both of these together are causing and increasing another risk which is referred to as homelessness. It is where these three are becoming together the cross-sectional elements whereby they are impacting women and their lives adversely. Moreover, what you see in the mainstream discourse is a very narrowed version of the mental health scenario of women as a gender in Indian society. It generally showcases upon the anxiety disorders, stress disorders or eating disorders or even the postpartum anxiety or even it is referred to as what is called as depression amongst women. Except this, the larger context of women's health particularly mental health has been clearly ignored from this perspective of cross-sectionality of violence, homelessness and adverse mental health. We will look into the details of this. This particular NFHS5 data clearly brings out certain patterns. First pattern is whenever a particular individual is going through violence within that age group, particularly this is more true when they are undergoing the sexual violence. This leads to the homelessness even when this mental health care is available. That means when they undergo stress because of such violence, they might go to the mental health care unit. However, the treatment is going to be on the basis of symptoms that they are experiencing rather than on the basis of this social scenario that they are undergoing. Hence, Homelessness is what becoming as a fundamental and more consequential problem than treatment of this mental health as a issue. The second pattern that emerges is whenever this violence ultimately even in the presence of availability of mental health care is leading to this situation of homelessness, it points to one more very very pertinent aspect. Whatever the manual that we have which is trying to delve into this mental health condition is clearly not in sync with 
what actually is happening on the ground. Meaning, this manual has to be redefined in such a way that it is not just based on whatever the symptoms that they experience in terms of stress or in terms of anxiety or in terms of even the disorders related to mental health. It must be expanded to include what is referred to as trauma on the basis of their own living experiences but not on the basis of this psychological or psychiatric symptoms that they experience. So, the second aspect that you see is trauma as such defined in the manual is very narrow in terms of focus because it is missing this intersectionality as an aspect. Third, most of this violence also occurs within the structural barriers of what is called as caste, gender and also this violence occurs within this particular institution of family. As you see this phenomena occurring, whenever violence is occurring, home which is conventionally seen as a place where your safety is ensured, your security is ensured, peaceful living is ensured, is becoming a place of trauma and it, within this particular notional definition of family which is living under a particular home or within a particular home is what getting deterred and it is this which is also causing mental health and hence within the structural barriers the issue is more pronounced than what actually has been seen within the institutional framework of treating this mental health. This is the third pattern that is emerging. The fourth pattern is whenever this is having this experience of child abuse, particularly child sexual abuse, then in most of those cases, you observe that this homelessness is occurring straight away, including the impact over their mental health. All this even is seemingly resulting into what socially we refer to as madness. However, this madness as such narrowly being seen within the structural barriers of patriarchy must be replaced with the nuanced understanding of madness as descent towards these conditions which have prevailed and resistance towards the conditions which have prevailed as per this latest data and latest emerging understandings that we are getting. Moving ahead, we also have this scenario that whatever the government's programs which are being implemented, for example, the district mental health program, within this program, the contours of the scheme is designed in such a way that all these social dimensions are missing. Moreover, we also have a scenario that cutting across this violence causing the mental illness in terms of adversely impacting their mental health and then causing this homelessness is more pronounced in some of the regions in India. It is all of these put together hence requires a serious attention towards mental health scenario of women not just as sudden symptoms and hence diagnosis but in terms of a radical social framework needed to treat this particular situation in terms of social change. Moving ahead, look at these government initiatives as you see their objectives and as you see the contours of these schemes you will understand that they are being designed primarily as psychiatric solutions rather than as social solutions. This national mental health program was launched in 1982. Look at these objectives. Availability and accessibility of minimum mental health care. Second, this must be available to most vulnerable and underprivileged sections of the population. However, it is clearly failing in terms of acknowledging this intersectionality. Second, encourage the application of mental health knowledge in general health care and social development. Third, Promote community participation in mental health service development and to stimulate efforts towards self-help within the community. It is this which now has to be enhanced even in terms of that particular manual that they follow. Moreover, 
within this national mental health program which had been a centralized program earlier as you clearly see we now have even a decentralization which has begun and this Aishman Bharat program has even created wellness centers within the PHCs. For this, they have utilized this district mental health program as one such decentralizing tool. However, even this particular program, which is based on what is referred to as Ballari model, where all these particular components were there. One, you detect it early and then treat it. As you clearly see, they are seeing this as a psychiatric problem rather than a social problem. Two, as this has been defined, now you are looking for certain psychiatrists, train them to treat this particular illness. Third, public awareness generation with regard to mental health is what included. And fourth, for monitoring purposes, they want to have the data where this records will be maintained. As you also see here, it is no way relating itself to this as a social challenge. Hence, what has to be done? As you clearly see, you must recognize and compensate women for whatever the unpaid labor that they do, which is the structural problem that they undergo within this so-called patriarchal setup in the society. Second, create space for women and make sure that there are supportive networks in the sense that there is not just one family that they have within their home, but they have what is called as alternate family structures such that they are outside of this typical what is called as heteronormative relationships such that they will be offering whenever there is need of such security what is referred to as refuge and security. Third, the state must also ensure that there is access to the basic income, housing and land ownership. If you look at the recent data as the land ownership of the females within the rural setup is marginally increasing accordingly you see that their participation in the labor force also seen some marginal change all this put together they offer economic independence and hence reduce the vulnerability of possibility of homelessness moving ahead within the education sphere there must be one significant change as can be recommended that is this curriculum must be designed in such a way that this adolescents must be in a position to interrogate and challenge whatever the harmful effects that they see because of the gendered norms which are pertinently present within the society which foster that the values of egalitarian norms are thoroughly imbibed and it also at the same time rejects any form of violence against women. These are all put together. Clearly a very progressive social change that we are aiming at such that this situation that we have seen through NFHS 5 can be reversed. And lastly, we also see that the role of childhood diversity which is clearly neglected in any data and in any kind of treatment must also be considered where this childhood diversity is what? Having very profound effect on development of their brain and hence it underscores the need for policies and interventions that reduce such violence within these formative years that any adolescent would go through, any child would go through. All these are part and parcel of the solutions that we can offer as social change based solutions rather than just merely focusing upon psychiatry based solutions. Having completed the discussion over the articles, we shall now move to these practice questions. Take this first prelims practice question. What are the implications of rise in the temperature of ocean water? One, intense marine heat waves, which is a correct one. Increase in the ocean stratification, which is also correct. Coral bleaching, which is also correct. Frequent cyclones and hurricanes, which has also been predicted and observed, which is also correct. Which of the above are correct? Answer has to be all of the above, that is D. Move to the second question. With reference to Mission Divyastra, which of the following statements are correct? One, it is a test of multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles technology, which is a correct statement. Second, 
the mission is aimed at strategic parity with adverse neighbors in defense capability which is also correct third it will strengthen the indian theory of nuclear deterrence which is also correct as we have discussed hence select the correct answer using the below answer has to be d 1 2 and 3 that is moving to third question consider the following statements the first statement is in tropical regions dengue virus disease is transmitted by the same mosquito that transmits zika and chikungunya which is also the same mosquito which also transmits even the other fever such as yellow fever second statement dengue cannot be spread directly from person to person we know that both the statements are correct however the question is asking you to identify the statements which are not correct hence answer has to be neither one nor two hence answer is d here move to the fourth question consider the following statements regarding viruses viruses can replicate independently through binary fission similar to bacteria which is an incorrect statement viruses lack cell organelles called ribosomes essential for protein synthesis which is the correct statement third all viruses lead to the death of the host cell after replication causing damage to the infected organism which is another incorrect statement which of the above statements are correct hence answer has to be two only b uh, must be the answer moving to the fifth question which among the following are key pillars of pradhan mantri jandhan yojana we have seen all those financial inclusion related pillars one universal access which is true two basic savings bank accounts with overdraft facility which is also true third financial literacy program which is also true and fourth creation of credit guarantee fund all being correct answer has to be all of the above for this particular question because it's asking you to identify the correct answer using the code given below moving to the mains practice question the recently released national family and health survey 5 had brought out new dimensions of vulnerability of women in india in the context of this statement critically analyze the status of women's mental health scenario in india 250 words question 15 marker how to approach this question and how to answer to this question introduction one can quote the data from the nfhs 5 as we have seen in our discussion to establish the cross-sectionality of the mental health of women as an issue in india second then we start analyzing critically what are those various patterns which are emerging out of these observations then at the conclusion we have to make sure that this social change as a scenario as a solution must be introduced in place of this linear unidimensional health-based scenario health-based solution such that the large scale prevalence of this mental health as an issue because of the intersectionality can be addressed i hope you have liked this discussion and hence liked this video please like share and comment on this video and make sure that you are hitting the bell icon and remain subscribed to our channel narayana ias one stop destination for all of your upsc civil service examination requirements We'll meet again with another edition of Daily News Analysis tomorrow. Until then, thank you.